It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all here today to celebrate Paul Robeson's 126th birthday. I'm Adam Welch, the Executive Director here at the Arts Council of Princeton okay. at the Paul okay. Robeson Center for the Arts. As you know, we're going to learn a little bit about Robeson today. We're going to do a couple of things, but I'll just give you a really quick, brief outline. Robeson was an athlete, singer, actor, lawyer, author, and activist. He happened to be born just behind me across the street, Green Street here, at what is now the Paul Robeson House of Princeton. We welcome them here this evening. We also welcome those members of the Witherspoon Jackson Historical and Cultural Society who have also co-sponsored tonight's birthday party. We are pleased that you could join us tonight for this exciting event. We have several treats for you this evening. First, desserts. Actually, the desserts come later, but we have cup cupcakes here donated by Ginger Peach. And we also, as I had mentioned, we have some drinks. Uh, and this will be, their drinks are out there now, but the cupcakes will come at the end, uh, donated by Halo Pub Farm. So we're very happy to have those here. Tonight's events were also supported by um, Ryan and Rachel Stark Lilienthal. First, we will kick things off with Shirley Satterfield, whom we will be speaking, uh, who will be speaking a bit about Paul Robeson here in Princeton. Then I'll introduce and we shall unveil the Paul Robeson uh, play project uh, uh, via Ryan Stark Lilienthal, who happens to be, and still is at the moment, the Ann Reeves Artist in Residence. Lastly, and before dessert, uh, will be Lisa Vitalico and her flamenco dancers, who have been practicing tirelessly a special choreographed performance of flamenco put to the words and songs of Paul Robeson in his time, around his time, that he was involved with the, uh, the Spanish Republican Civil War. <coughs> Sheridan Satterfield, educator, Princeton historian, and founder of the Witherspoon Jackson Historical and Cultural Society, which is preserving and sharing the history of Princeton's African American community, and her life, she's dedicated to history, uh, and the devotion to education and historic preservation, and it's very impressive. Uh, being in Shirley, Miss Satterfield's presence is um, absolutely amazing. You can feel her passion and excitement. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's a good catch. I call her Shirley. But it should not. It totally should not. Um, Miss Satterfield is the fourth of six generations of the Van Zandt Moore May family in Princeton. She graduated from Princeton High School graduated a degree in elementary education from Bennett College for Women, and earned her master's degree in guidance personnel services from Trenton State College, now the College of New Jersey. Ms. Satterfield moved back to Princeton in 1981, and keeping the history of the Princeton African American community alive has been Ms. Satterfield's passion, including starting a walking tour of African American life in Princeton, and there were some flyers on the chairs. She'll um, address what those are, but um, it's a little bit to do with the tour. Um, she is presently the president of the Witherspoon Jackson Historical and Cultural Society and serves as a board member of Not In Our Town, Princeton Historic Preservation Commission, Princeton Master Plan Committee, secretary of the Paul Rosen Board, and partner with the Einstein Museum of, how is this possible? Partner with the Einstein Museum of Science. Anything else I missed in there? Let me look at the drawer here. So, pretty amazing. Um, so anyway, without further ado, Ms. Shirley Satterfield. journey back 
to 1860, 30 years before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, but a 15-year-old freed himself from the bondage of slavery and traveled from North Carolina to Pennsylvania. This ex-slave, William Drew Robeson, was a God-fearing young man who joined the United the Union Army, completed his elementary education, worked as a farm laborer, and in 1872, enrolled at Hilton University. I should put that up here for um, We do have a person here who graduated from the uh, Most of our men who went to, went to Princeton University and weren't accepted went to Lincoln, and they started calling Lincoln the Black Princeton. But his father went to Lincoln University, it was called Ashman Institute, and it started to train black men, they were colored then, to uh, go to Liberia to teach, or to preach, or to become ministers. And Reverend Robeson graduated from Lincoln University with a degree in theology. <coughs> when a student in Lincoln, he met Maria Louisa Bustle, a teacher from a prominent Philadelphia family of abolitionists whose heritage was colored, Native American, and Quaker. She was born on November 1853. The Bustles were related to the Steele family. William Steele was an Underground Railroad worker and author of the classic book, The Underground Railroad. Now, this is a younger picture of William Drew Robeson. The woman standing up is Maria Louisa Bustle. Her father's in the middle, her sister is, at the, is sitting next to him. And then you see the entire Bustle family, a prominent family from Philadelphia. Reverend Robeson was, uh, was asked to come to Princeton by a man whose name was Isaac Stockton. Isaac Stockton lived in the house on the corner of Witherspoon and Green Street. He was a commissioner. He, he asked Paul Robeson's father to come to be a minister here. He had already been a minister in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. So he came here in 18, I can't remember the date now, 1896. Paul's childhood. <coughs> Paul's early life in Princeton centered around three corners of Witherspoon. If you look at your papers that I gave you, you see the, 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 all of those areas where he grew up. Green Street and Witherspoon Street where he lived. The location of the house where he was born on the corner of Green and Witherspoon. Quarry and Witherspoon Street, where his father was a minister of Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church, and where he worshiped, and on the train and Witherspoon Streets, where he attended kindergarten through fourth grade. He felt at home in this colored community where the residents called each other brother or sister. If one were to list all the people who raised him, it would read like the roster of Google Christians. When Paul was three years old, the love and care of his relatives and neighbors was especially needed when his father, Reverend William Drew Robeson, was dismissed as pastor of Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. This is Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. The slaves in the first Presbyterian Church, which is at Nassau, um, when there was a second fire at Nassau, the slaves, 90 of them of the 100 and some slaves, came down Witherspoon Street and started the church of their own and it was called the First Presbyterian Church of Color. And in 1848, they changed it to the Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. This is how it went to the Reverend Robeson. He was a minister there. Now, when Reverend Robeson was dismissed from our church in 1901, now some people say, why was he dismissed? They thought the Presbyterian, you know, there's a Presbyterian church. Above that is a Presbyterian. Above that is a synod. Well, the Presbyterian thought that he was spending too much time um, for the rights of the Negro, and that he couldn't do that and preach at the same time. So they dismissed him from our church after 21 years. And when they dismissed him, he could no longer live in the house on the corner of Winston and Crawford and Green Street because it was a man's. So he moved around to, to Green Street, and it didn't have a siding, and it didn't have air conditioning. 
But this is where his family lived from 1901 to 1907. While he was in this house, his, his wife caught hold of a fire, her father caught, 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 caught fire. And she suffered terribly. And Paul Rose really doesn't remember because he was three years old and he probably wasn't even in the house. But when she got, when she, excuse me, she died severely. She um, suffered severely and she also went blind. But she was also a teacher in Princeton for a while. And when she died, Paul Robeson's father wanted her to be buried in proximity to their house. So if you were to go to the house on Green Street and go across the street, you would go into the cemetery. And, her, and she is buried there. Now the question is, how could she be buried in the cemetery when it was owned by the Presbyterian Church? And there were no black people who were buried in that part of the cemetery. Well, he was a Presbyterian minister and was able to get permission from the Presbytery to bury his wife there. You see her tombstone and his tombstone also on paper. Mm -hmm. This is Maria Louisa Bustle, his, his brother. And this is their tombstone. So if you were to go down the path, you would go directly to their tombstone. While he was in Princeton, his siblings were away. They were away in school. And he was living there with his father, and he loved his father. His father was old enough to be his grandfather, but he loved Pop. And, the, and when his Pop went to Westfield to find a place to live, he became a Methodist minister. Paul was taken care of by many people in the community, the people in the community and also his relatives. So these were some of the women who took care of Paul while his father was away in Westfield. His early education. This is Betsy Stockton. Most of you have heard of Betsy Stockton. Betsy Stockton was born in the Stockton family in Princeton. She was an enslaved woman. And she was taught by Ashbel Green. Ashbel Green was the president of Princeton University, one of the presidents. And when she got her manumission, she got her missionary. And she went to the Hawaiian Islands with the Stewart family. The Stewart family was there for a while and Mrs. Stewart got very ill. So they came back to Princeton. And when they came back to Princeton, Betsy went to Philadelphia and she went to Canada to teach. And then she came back to Princeton and taught in a little building that was given to her by the women of the First Presbyterian Church somewhere up on Witherspoon Street. We call her our first colored teacher. She was a, then she was a teacher and she also started a Sabbath school at Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. In 1851, Princeton started public education. The white students went to the schools, but where did the colored children go? They started the school. Now we have a question about this date, and I think that the date is incorrect. I think it's, um, it's 1851, and 53. But they built this school on the corner, and it's on your paper, on the corner of McLean Street and Witherspoon Street and they called it Witherspoon School for Colored Children. In that picture somewhere, the picture is 1904. Somewhere in that picture is Paul Robeson. Now there's not a person alive who knows where Paul Robeson is in that picture. <laughs> the only person who may have known would have been Mr. Hines because Mr. Hines was his contemporary. But, um, and this is the register of one teacher who taught Paul Robeson in first grade. They're just the boys in the class. And you can see highlighted is Paul Robeson, who was at eight years old and did the 13 Green Street. Now this is a trolley. This is a trolley used to go down, down um, Witherspoon Street from Spring Street, down Township, through Valley Road, and into Trenton. The reason I'm showing you this is because when the colored children graduated from Witherspoon Street for colored children, they were not allowed to go to high school in Princeton. So that passage you see was found when they cleaned out this, the house, Paul Wilson house, and it fell out the wall and it was in a little envelope. 
And they started to throw it away. They said, let's look in here and see what's in this envelope. It was a pass for William Drew Jr. to go into Trenton on the trolley to go to high school. Now some students were here because their parents came from the South to get employment in Princeton. And when they graduated, most of them went back down south to go to school. This is what the school looks like now. It's on the corner of the Fame Little School. It is now, it was at one time called Frederick Douglass Hall. And it was a hall for a lot of activities of African Americans. And this is the school where it was on Quarry Street. Many of you know where the black school is on Quarry Street? Well, that's what it looked like when it was first started in 18, in 1908. And these are some of the children. Now the reason I'm showing this is because somewhere in there are Paul Wilson's cousins. There are a lot of his relatives who came from North Carolina to Princeton. And I often ask, if you look at that picture, what do you notice about those children? Nobody smiled, right? <laughs> They're all dressed up in the Sunday dress and nobody smiled. But I finally found out there's one man who said why, and I don't know if it's true. But in those days, you know, the, the photographers put their head in this thing to put their, uh, cover their heads, and then they had the flash. Well, the kids probably thought that took too long to take their pictures, so it's not <laughs> This is another picture, and in this picture are some people who are removed whose relatives are still alive. This is Massey's in that picture, but anyone knows Simon Massey's, Silas Massey. The two little boys at the bottom in the dark suits are my uncles. There's Mr. Macon, who's related to a person, um, Jenny, Jenny Carter, I don't know if any of you remember Jenny Carter. But these are children, now there's something in that picture, again, to notice. There's a little white girl in that picture. Yeah. Yeah. And when I took this picture to the high school, it happened at the same day I took the picture that her brother called to ask about her um, going to the school for colored children. And we had a lot of Italians who lived in this community. They came to Stone Cutter for the university. And the question was, why is she there? Because her mother said, why should she work all, walk all the way uptown to go to school when she had to go to school right in this neighborhood? These are the colored teachers who taught us at the School for Colored Children. Now you might say, why are you telling us this if we're talking about Paul Wilson? Because all of this is connected to Paul Wilson. He still has relatives here in Princeton. His family. This is his brother, Ben. His brother, Ben, went to college. Um, we get the information. His brother Ben attended Bill University, which is now Johnson C. Smith. He became a minister and at Mother AME Zion Church. His older brother was William Drew Wilson Jr. He was called a schoolboy. He first went graduated from Trenton High School. He was considered the most brilliant. He became a physician in Washington, D.C. Then there was Reed. Reed was a family rebel. He told Paul, don't ever take it from them. Defend yourself from the white man's law. He, brought, he had brushes with the law. He was sent to the Robeson House, from the Robeson House to Detroit. He was involved in bootlegging and gambling, and thought he died on Skid Row. And then there's Marion. Marion went to, to Scotia College, Walter Scotia College. She became a teacher, and she lived in Philadelphia. This is his sister, who he finally lived with when he, when he moved to Philadelphia. And this is his wife, Esfanda. Esfanda was a secretary, she was a writer, she was an activist, she was an anthropologist, a photographer, an actress, a traveler. They say she probably was more involved than, than Paul Wilson was. But this is the woman who he married, Eslanda Cardonos, Cardonos Good. 
This is their wedding invitation, their announcement and their invitation. And this is his son, Paul Jr. Paul used to come here to visit. He visited here when they opened up the new uh, part of the uh, Arts Council. And this is his family at the christening of his grandson, David. So there's David in the middle. It's Paul's wife sitting down, Paul's um, Julie's wife sitting down, um, his, his brother. And David came to Princeton one time. And he came to our church. And he looked at the window that was dedicated to Paul Lewis's brother. And I went up to him and I said, you want me to tell you about that window? And he said, yeah, I'm Paul Lewis's grandson. And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and it was Paul Lewis's grandson, so I took him to the house where he was born. I took him to all the Paul Lewis's sites, and he would often come back. And he joined our church. And then one time he came to my house, and <coughs> my mother said, here's David. And David didn't look well. And whatever he had, he died about a week before we celebrated Paul Lewis's 101st birthday. And this is Paul and his mother as he got older. Now during his life, he met um, Marion Anderson. There's a connection with Marion Anderson and Paul, and also with Einstein and Paul. When Marion Anderson came to sing at Mahara Theater, she wasn't able to stay at any of the hotels. So Einstein took her in. When Paul Rosen came to sing at Mahara Theater, he took in Paul Rosen, and they became friends. And Einstein also was an adjunct professor at Lincoln University. Now these are some renderings of Paul Rosen as a singer. He was a scholar an all-American athlete, a lawyer, a singer, an actor, a humanitarian, and an Alpha Phi Alpha brother. Now this is when he sang Old Man River, and he changed some of the words to Old Man River because it was derogatory to African Americans. This is Showboat, Othello, and when he was an activist. And when he was older, he lived at his, his, his daughter's his sister's house, Marion, and they have now Paul Robeson House in Philadelphia. He was born in Pigskill, New York. And now we go to the Paul Robeson House. These are some renderings of the Paul Robeson House on the corner of Quarry, you see it on the, on the display on the corner of Quarry and Witherspoon Street. It was a single family house. And let me give you some information about that. In the 1830s, a pile of land known as the Ferguson Tract included Jackson Street, now Paul Wilson Place, Green Street, and Quarry Street. Houses were beginning to be built on this tract. And in 1842, a house on the corner of Witherspoon and Green Streets was constructed. The house was at one time rented by Isaac Stockton, known as a town commissioner. Anthony Simmons, a colored man who came to Princeton from the, from the Alexandria, D.C. area, was a highly respected and honest man who owned an ice cream parlor, an oyster cellar, and a confectionery store on Nassau Street. He was also a caterer for many families in Princeton. In 1847, Anthony Simmons bought the lot where this house is, and when he died in 1868, he left a will leaving half a dozen houses, and as a deacon and elder of Woodsville Street Presbyterian Church, he left this house as a parsonage. Now, I'm showing you this picture and there's a little bit of That's the Paul Robeson house as it looked before 18, uh, 1911. It was a double house. Now, everybody talks about a double house 70 and 72, but nobody's ever seen it. And one day I had this picture that I use when I do a presentation 
And it was Robert Killian who said, look at that house. The railing on that house looks just like the railing on the house on the corner of John and Witherspoon and Quarry Streets. So the reason I have this house here is because it really was a double house, 1772. And this picture was taken before 1911. Now how do I know it was before 1911? The man who was on the end, does this have a little, little thing here? Is there a button? Oh, okay. This man right here, that was Edward Moore. And Edward Moore was my grandmother's first husband, and he drowned in Carnegie Lake. And he was one of the coaches for these, these guys. And that's how I know that this had to be before 1912. The man on the far end with the hat on, if you know Tommy Parker, that's Tommy Parker's grandfather. The man standing up, the taller man, that is Mr. Moore. That's John Moore's grandfather. And the man in the middle was a minister, Reverend Starr, who was a minister after, after Reverend Wilson. Now these men are sitting on this double porch, and one is 70 and one is 72. But when Paul Robeson and his family lived here, it was just 72. And then it was divided into 70 and 72 with the school street. Now the trolley tracks you see are the trolley tracks where the trolley would go down with the school street. <coughs> They also called this area, the, if you were to stand right here, um, where Paul Wilson placed his, looking down Witherspoon Street, they used to call that African Alley. We never gave it that name, but that's a very important thing we gave because that was where the African American community saw. This is another rendering of a single of a single house. Now, where the star is, there's no star on that one. It's down in the corner where that little round circle is. What you'll see is as I as I show these slides, you'll see how the house has changed. Now, this is the 19, 1900 census, and the 1900 census tells who was in that house at the time. It was a two-family house. Oh, let me, let me find that. Let's go back to my notes. Okay. Now, I don't think you can see it, but if you look at the top, it says William. It says Robeson William. He was 55, and he was the owner of the house. Then we go to the next, it says Emma White. Her name was not Emma, her name was um, Maria Louisa Bustle. And then it shows the first child, who was William Jr., who was 18. And then there's Ben, who was 14, and Marion, who was five, and, Benjamin, and then we have um, Paul Robeson, who was then two years old. Now, there was a man who was a groomer in the house, and they called him a lodger. And his name was Fred Ferdinand Spelling. And Ferdinand Spelling was a commissioner in Princeton. Okay, now you see here, it start, it's now in uh, 70 and 70 with, with the school street. It's a double house. You see those are? Now watch how it changes. Now they added on. It's still 70 and 72 in 1906. And then you see at the bottom it says Men's Association. That's where the, uh, this building is now that was then a color block. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because in 1918, there were more houses on Witherspoon Street and it now became 108 and 110 Witherspoon Street. And there's Paul Wilson House as it looks today. Well, it did look like that today. Uh -huh. Now, at the bottom, let me get this little thing here. Okay. You see where that little round thing is? Mm -hmm. At the bottom, where it was a little building, uh, the house became a rooming house. And it was called the Ellerby House. And when it was a rooming house, there also was a little section at the bottom. And that's where the men who worked on the avenue 
They call it working on the avenues. Men who worked on at the Eating Club called Prospect. And they would come here for time to rest. It also was a barbershop that was owned by David Graham because most of our houses, there was either a barbershop or beauty parlor or grocery store or candy store because we couldn't shop on Nassau Street. So this was the house that became a rooming house after the Wilsons moved out. Now we come to the structure of the house. It's a proposed design of the house that was a design build as to how it would look in the future. And this is when they were demolishing the house, the back of the house. And if you were to go in the house before it was demolished, you could be on the second floor here in one bedroom, and then you go across the hall and you would be in the bedroom here because there was no zoning. And they always added on because it became a rooming house for people who came to Princeton and needed a place to stay. And this is how it looks today as it's being repaired. In 1919, in 2025, we will have a grocery house. <clears throat> and um, Benjamin, would you like to say something about grocery house? <laughs> well, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> I can't not say something. <laughs> uh, we're very proud of this project. You heard that the house has had a long history. It is very important that it be preserved so that we can remember the story, celebrate Fort Wilson, and also leave a legacy of his presence. His presence and all of the other people that have meant so much to the development of this community. So, uh, thank you very much. Now, in 2008, 2008 is when they added on the new section of this Arts Council. And who you see is one of the first directors, who is Jeff Nathanson. And next to him is one of the board members. And sitting down is the architect. I can't remember his name. Michael Gray. Michael Gray. Michael Gray. And then behind him is um, Ann Reeves. And next to her is Paul Wilson Jr. And then the two mayors, the mayor of the borough, who was Herbert Trotman, and the mayor of the town of Township, who was himself. And then you see the plaque for Paul Wilson. And um, in our church, well, our church was renovated in 1988, 1998. Uh, some of the pews we kept because they were important pews. Because Paul Wilson sat in some of those pews, we don't know which ones. But one of them was taken and was refurbished at Princeton High School. I took it to the guidance department. And a woman whose name is Ms. Olive Giles, who's a guidance, guidance counselor there a guidance um, secretary. She had it restored, and it's now like a monument that's in Princeton High School. And that's one of the chairs that's called the Paul Wilson Pew. Now, remembering his childhood days in Princeton, I felt at home in this color community. Residents called each other brother or sister, and if one were to miss all the people who helped raise me, it would read like the roster of Liberal Princeton. I was surrounded by relatives in the neighborhood who followed my father from Martin County, North Carolina, to Princeton, New Jersey. My young years were spent hugged to saw hearts in our bosoms of my hard-working relatives. And remembering his years as a performer and actor, activist, through my singing and acting and speaking, I want to make freedom ring. Maybe I can touch people's hearts better than I can their minds with a common struggle and a common love. Thanks. so much.
surely that um, is center field. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. Um, now we're going to head into the next portion of this um, project, and I'll make a few announcements before we bring up the next speaker. Um, of course, it will be my honor to introduce former board member uh, and current Ann Reeves artist in residence, Ryan Stark Lilienthal. Um, but before I, I mention that, I do want to say that the, the Ann Reeves Artist in Residency, which has been um, going on for, for a decade, a little over a decade now, uh, is a really important aspect of what, one of the many different aspects of what we do. And, uh, you know, su uh, support for this residency has made so much great public art available and has made this project available. And one of the supporters uh, of this residency, who's been sort of the um, underwriter of the program, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Timothy Andrews, who I believe um, might be here tonight. If you are, Timothy, can you stand up and, and say hello? Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Timothy has been um, Tim Andrews. Terrible with this. Miss Satterfield, Timothy Andrews. Um, Tim has been a, a sort of a, a really a superhero of the Arts Council and has uh, recently endowed our artistic directorship here um, and that's uh, Maria Evans's position uh, and just it's making it's helping so much and it's been so appreciated so thank you Tim for all that support um, so this next project is is you know, it was really um, exciting for me to watch happen. And um, it was one of those projects that just uh, sort of took on a life of, life of its own. And it's a ceramic-based project, and I work in clay, uh, so I was really excited about it. And uh, the lovely thing about how this unfolded is um, the artist and lawyer and um, all-around sort of crazy individual that just <coughs> have at it and just made it all happen. Uh, did an amazing job and that's, and that's Ryan Lilienthal. But before we get there, uh, uh, so I'll, um, I'll briefly sort of uh, explain how this happened if you didn't read about it already. Um, so Ryan was, uh, is the short-term resident, uh, which his residency is running through the end of the month. If you don't know what that, uh, the artist in residence means, basically we offer opportunities for artists to come and um, experiment to pursue some aspect of, of their vision that they may or may not have otherwise have access to. Um, and so we generally have between two and four of those a, a year where there's um, some aspect of support and then generally some sort of exhibition that takes place. Uh, but while, uh, while Ryan was here, um, uh, he uh, happened to be walking past the construction site uh, right next, to, right behind us on Green Street. If, if your, uh, your bearings are a little out of sorts walking through this uh, sort of split level building. Right behind here is Green Street, and the images that uh, Miss Satterfield was showing you of uh, the Paul Rose House of Princeton is, is just right through that door. So if you, um, on your way out, if you're not familiar, or you did not know this information, which could be possible, um, on your way out, just head that way, break the traffic and all of the construction, and you'll be able to see the house and the progress that they've made. Um, anyway, so while Ron was walking by, he uh, spotted some clay and he brought it over and uh, he was like, hey, I, I just found this clay and it was just this absolutely gorgeous uh, color right out of the earth. And what a lot of people don't realize about many things in life is that, um, uh, like they say, money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, you know, clay uh, is just under our feet. Sometimes just a few inches, sometimes a few feet, but it's pretty much all over the world and uh, not everywhere, but pretty much all over, the, uh, all over the world. A lot of people don't always make that association. Anyway, so Ryan dug this out, brought it over, we fired it, and it was the absolute most beautiful clay. Uh, sorry, once clay is fired, it's called ceramic. Most beautiful ceramic I had, um, I had seen. And, um, and that got Ryan thinking. And uh, we worked together with the Paul Rose and House of Princeton and uh, uh, put together this proposal, and Ryan's gonna talk a little bit about it. And um, I think it turned out pretty magical. And I, I uh, made an acknowledgement to the Pogo House and House of Princeton. I think only Ben was here at the time, but we have a few more uh, from the house here this, this evening. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. 
and we'll talk a little bit more about that partnership as we go, but I wanted to introduce uh, Ryan. So um, Ryan Stark Lilienthal. Ryan is an interdisciplinary artist and designer. He recently graduated with an MFA in design from Rutgers University, Mason Grove School of the Arts, where he received the Lori Spitz Prize for his thesis, Designing for Multidirectional Remembrance. Maybe he'll talk about what that is. Um, uh, Ryan harnesses uh, uh, analog and digital media to explore social justice themes and draws on his career as an immigration attorney uh, for his visual vocabulary. Significantly, his grandparents' flight from Nazi persecution and the genocide transgenerational impact percolates through his installation and surfaces in his drawings and paintings. Through collaborations with fellow artists, designers, and community members, Ryan seeks to animate animate struggles with trauma, dislocation, and alienation that characterize much of contemporary life. Localized projects center these collaborations and anchor memory with place to cultivate a sense of belonging. So without further ado, Ryan. Shout out to um, Rutgers University. Um, we were interested in having the clay tested. So this is not only an art project <coughs> and a history project and a memory project, but it's also a science project. Um, and so um, Dr. Joy and I have been working together to arrange a visit um, um, for Princeton High School students who have collaborated in this to go to uh, the chemistry department at Rutgers um, and um, talk with the the chemist, the material scientist who studied the clay from behind us. Um, um, so we have a, yet another layer of connection to uh, what's happening here. Um, so, uh, um, so thank you, Paul. Um, so as Adam was uh, describing and in my bio, I'm very interested in memory and my understanding of memory is that it's really a handful that all of us have for, to um, seeking, um, longing for, yearning for a sense of belonging. And what's rooted my career as an immigration attorney equally roots my career as an artist uh, coming from a heritage of trauma. All four of my grandparents fled Nazi persecution. Uh, my father and I both had our DNA tests and as I'm examining all these matches and discovering all these family trees, the breadth of the trauma is just becoming apparent. We thought our family got out and it's become apparent that we're discovering um, through all these connections that we're making that we didn't all get out. Um, and so my thesis at uh, Rutgers as an MFA in design looked at this idea of multi-directional memory. And we thought that as an individual coming from a heritage of trauma, uh, I don't need to feel in competition with individuals from other communities who come from heritage of trauma. Instead, what we can do is learn from each other, be inspired by each other, and, um, and, um, and teach each other about how we grapple with that trauma. And so instead of 
being in competition, my trauma is worse than your trauma. Instead, we're connecting with each other and learning about that process um, so we can bring meaning and understanding and connectedness uh, to a, a challenging past. And so this project is really literally grounded in that. So to the extent that the memory is about belonging and seeking connection to the past, what's meaningful about using clay and digging it from the ground is a connectedness with the material. We've become you know, separated in, this, in our modern lives from things that are made, you know, the separation of consumption, and the production and consumption. Here's a process where um, I was able to collaborate uh, with the Paul Rosenhouse, the Arts Council, and Princeton High School and students there to, with our hands, take earth out of the ground, you know, and thank you, Paul Rosen, from the Paul Rosen House, from the Paul Rosen House, and um, make things. And what we made were, were tiles. And in the tiles, we imprinted quotes from Paul Rosen. And so we have a very interconnected process to honor Paul Rosen's legacy, doing it in a multi-directional memory type of way. And um, we all hope that these tiles that the students made and that we, that we collaborate on will now be part of the, uh, the life and the future of the Paul Rosen House. And so this has been a tremendously meaningful process for me, and, um, and I'm, I'm grateful for everyone for being part of it. We did do some science. It's less interesting to, to everybody, I guess, but it was really exciting. Uh, and so what you see down here are, uh, this is the clay uh, fired at different temperatures. All right, so uh, as it gets hotter, it gets, it gets darker. The, the minerals, uh, the iron and uh, manganese and stuff in it tend to, to brown. Uh, and so you can see it gets darker, but it's a beautiful variety. And so um, I wanted it done. So Ryan did all the work, and uh, so after making all these tiles and measuring all the, uh, the uh, increments of drying and then firing and then firing at the different temperatures, I said, now you have to take it home and boil it for a few hours. So after he, he weighed it and measured it and boiled it, uh, and he weighed it again, all the results are outside. Uh, there'll be a test later, but all the results are outside on a, a little bu a bulletin board. So you should look at those results because it's really, truly fascinating. But, Thank you so much, it was absolutely amazing. Um, and this will be on display and uh, here and, and, and elsewhere as well. Uh, thank you, Ryan. So we've prepared, uh, we've prepared a, uh, a short project. And I should mention, um, you know, I kind of said it kiddingly, but I, I wasn't really kidding. Um, Ryan went absolutely head over heels for Clay and was, Every day he wasn't getting. Every day he would come in. It was like, look where I, I got this clay. I went. I went to this person's yard and I dug this clay up. And then um, you know he he must have uh, you know jumped town, Rutgers. So he's doing all this testing of clay all over. And there is this book for people that have nothing else to do at night and you can't sleep. Um, geolog the state geologist in 1904 
wrote a 600 page book. Um, it's fascinating reading. Um, and in that, you know, I sort of said to Ryan, to, to, you know what they say about, don't listen Ryan, but you know, with children they say misdirection, right, if things get out of control. And so I said, oh Ryan, you know that book, there's a map in the back. And there's about 400 different locations where the state geologist dug clay and tested it. I said, wouldn't it be great, Ryan, if you dug all of the same 400 different locations around the state? And I think he's gonna do it. So I'm really, really excited um, about the results because uh, that was 120 years ago. So I think that is a great project for him. Uh, we're looking, we're currently in the process of looking for grant funding to support that project. So if anybody is really keen on seeing that, Maybe the municipality of Princeton would like to support it. I don't know, we'll see. So anyway, um, uh, uh, you'll see the participation from the Princeton High School students, but this video, it's, um, it's about seven minutes long. It doesn't quite capture um, all of the excitement and joy of those students, but there is something quite wonderful about um, you know, seeing people outside you know, the classroom, being able to really embrace education on several different levels, right? Just reading and memory, reading and memorization is only one kind of learning. Um, anybody from the school board is here, right? It's not the most important kind of learning, but it is an important kind of learning. Uh, but getting your hands uh, in the clay and then um, being able to learn different things. So one of the teachers, one of the geology teachers came out uh, with the students and they had a lesson. Right about value and use value and material value and all this kind of stuff. So there was a, it was a multi-dimensional lesson. So it was quite spectacular. Anyway, you won't get that from this video, but we're going to watch the video now, and then um, we have a few more announcements, and then we'll br we'll break into the, the flamenco. So without further ado. Oh. 
So um, Ryan's presenting a uh, full complete set of the tiles for the Rosen House. Princeton.
been our delight. Um, when I think about some of the words of Paul Rosen, I think that about the radical voice that comes from artists. And so it is absolutely befitting. But if you're like me, if you're like Paul Rosen, science and art go hand in hand. So this was absolutely something that we thought was really important, especially for this moment. And the idea of multi-directional memory, especially for this moment, is critical. So thank you for even acknowledging that no one's trauma is greater than anyone else's, but that we can heal together. And so thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Arts Council, for the vision. I always say thank you, Mama Shirley, for just always keeping us humble and allowing us to remember. Because again, remembrance is about taking each of us as individuals, tying us together as one. And so it is with that that I would love to uh, have the entire beloved community meet the newest member of the Paul Rosen House of Princeton. He is our executive director, Randy Wiggins. consistent basis, they have led lives from the civil rights movement for decades to the current day. Uh, makes me feel like I'm lazy uh, in terms of what I'm doing. So I'm grateful to you, Shirley. I'm grateful to you, Ben, for the lives that you've lived and the work that you've done and what you're still doing uh, today. Uh, I went to Princeton, something that Paul Robeson wasn't able to do. And when I think about this work and his work, both in the United States and globally, I see all these areas of connection. We talk about memory, right? Uh, my mother was a trained social worker, career social worker. And uh, one of the things she told my siblings and I, that if you have an ability to help, you have a responsibility to help. Mm -hmm. So that's what drove me to come to Princeton and the major in the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, whose mantra is in the nation's service and in the service of all nations. And that's the work that Paul was doing. Uh, I talked about religion in the beginning, and I'll close by saying this. I know that God's hand is in this, uh, because if you look at Robeson Place, uh, my last name is, is Wiggins. And if you know the street, it, it's, it's Wiggins Street. Uh, so I always look for signs to make sure that I'm on the right track. Uh, this is definitely one of those signs. So I look forward to meeting you all, getting to know you, and the work is just beginning. And we are committed to finishing this house and ensuring that this Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood uh, becomes a model for neighborhoods across the country and becomes a model for really our nation and bringing us back together uh, once again. I'm excited to see this room, to see this mix of people. It's what Paul would have wanted. It's what Albert Einstein would have wanted. It's what everyone in his family would have wanted. So thank you all uh, for being here today. And, and the work is just getting started. For Paul <laughs> project um, for this residency and for bringing Paul Rose and House of Princeton and the rest of this community together. Um, so uh, thank you very much. We, we do have one more special gift. And this is for the Witherspoon Jackson. further ado.
do. Yeah. All right, I am going to introduce the next performer, and I'm going to move some of this stuff for safety. <laughs> Spain, 1937 to 1938. The Spanish Civil War began as a rebellion led by General Franco against the legally elected, legally elected Republican government in July 1936. The rebels opposed liberal changes such as land reforms and provisions for women's education, legal divorce, and the right to vote. In large cities such as Madrid, Barcelona, civilian militias successfully resisted the military uprising, but Franco appealed to European fascist dictators Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy, who sent armed forces to Spain in 1937. German planes bombed the town of Guernica, an atrocity that inspired Pablo Picasso's famous Guernica painting. Uh, Lisa, before we begin, Lisa Vitalico, for 25 years, Lisa has captivated our hearts with her unparalleled talent and dedication to the art of flamenco. I know this wasn't in your notes. I had to add this. Um, her influence extends well beyond our dance studio, shaping the lives of countless dancers and enriching our own community with the passion and grace of this vibrant art form. As we celebrate her tw remarkable 25-year milestone, we are embarking on a special in this initiative, naming our dance studio in her honor. It's a tribute worthy of her legacy, a lasting testament to her enduring impact on our organization and the world of flamenco. We invite you to be part of this exciting endeavor by contributing to our campaign. Your support will help us rename the studio, uh, but it also ensures that the future of generations of dancers continue to benefit from uh, Le um, Lisa's legacy of excellence. Together we cre create this lasting tribute that reflects the profound impact Lisa has on our community. I should mention that I was a student of Lisa's, though briefly. Um, I, gotta t I gotta tell you, um, I could not keep up. I could not keep up. My body couldn't keep up. My mind couldn't keep up. Nothing of me could keep up with Lisa. And uh, not only that, she did it with such grace and poise and passion. It was awe-inspiring and uh, it's so great to be in her presence. And when she said that she wanted to choreograph um, a performance uh, based on Paul Robeson's time in Spain, I thought there could be no better uh, tribute. So, oh, I'm gonna move forward here. All right, this is yours. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to the Arts Council for supporting me through this incredible project. I am so deeply honored to have this opportunity to remember Paul Robeson's support of freedom during the Spanish Civil War through his powerful words and music. They speak to us today as powerfully as they did then. Now what better place to bring together music, dance, art, poetry than the Paul Robeson Center of the Arts right here in Princeton. Why flamenco? Okay, well, Paul Robeson is about to tell us in his own words, which I will read, why flamenco. So in 1938, uh, the famous black Cuban poet, Nicolas Guillén, covered the Spanish Civil War, and he interviewed Paul Robeson 
And he claimed Robeson talked to him enthusiastically about Spanish music. And here are his words. I have been surprised and delighted by the similarity between black music and some Spanish music. The Flamencan song is black in its rhythm and its sad depths. In Madrid, during a concert, I asked them to play Flamencan music. The artist very courteously did so, and then I could sing a black song without the musicians having to change the rhythm with which they had accompanied the cante hondo in the least. Now the cante hondo is the soulful, powerful Spanish music and dance. And so he goes on and says, because of that, I want to return to Spain when there is more calm, when we have won the war to gather and study many songs of this kind. Now also in his autobiography, Here I Stand, Robeson writes, interested as I am in the universality of mankind, in the fundamental relationship of all peoples to one another, this idea of a universal body of music intrigued me and I pursued it along many fascinating paths. My people have been reared on the pentatonic scale and melodies in Africa and in America. No wonder Lawrence Brown introduced me to flamenco and to the Manuel de Falla of Spain. Now Lawrence Brown, you may know, is a Paul Robeson's um, longtime accompanist and arranger, and you'll be hearing him playing in some of the music we are using tonight. And you will also be hearing Manuel de Falla's Haunting Asturiana later in the program, played by violist Joel Rubin. Okay, so here you see, uh, this is a program. Uh, so did that answer why flamenco before I go ahead? I think it did, yes. So um, this is a program. Um, you see, I don't know if you can see, but it says that it was supposed to be broadcasting from Moscow, but instead uh, he flew to, um, to the Royal Albert Hall in England to deliver this speech, and this was to help to raise funds for the vast relief aid. Um, then we could have the next slide, and there he is. Uh, he's going to sing and, and give his speech. So I will leave you now with Paul Robeson's speech, um, and I will be followed by Cante Hondo by Lejondo Flamenco. Thank you very much. deeply happy to contribute to this cause of Spanish culture and of the vast children in particular, a cause which must concern everyone who stands for freedom, progressive democracy, and for humanity. Today, the artist cannot hold himself aloof. Through the destruction in certain countries of the greatest of man's cultural heritage, through the propagation of false ideas of racial and national superiority, the scientist, the writer, the artist is challenged. The challenge must be taken up. For this culture, a legacy from our predecessors, is the foundation upon which we build a higher and all-embracing culture. It belongs not only to us, not only to the present generation, it belongs to our posterity and must be courageously defended. The forces of reaction have made no distinction between combatants and non-combatants. The beautiful village of Guernica, nestled in the vast hills with its blood-soaked streets, is proof of that. These victims must be given every possible aid. This Common humanity demands.
There's still more to come. Robeson and his wife, Islanda Essie Robeson, went to Spain in 1938. He sang often to raise funds for children displaced by the war and appealed for assistance to the Spanish Republic, raising $8,000. That's $176,000 in today's dollars. Robeson also recorded speeches and songs which were broadcast to troops of the Republic and the international brigades. He visited hospitals, singing to the wounded soldiers. Robeson also visited the battlefront and provided a morale boost to the Republic funds. Thirty years later, this is a, a photo of Robeson picture here with members of the International Brigade. Thirty years later, a former member of the International Brigade said, although, quote, although many details of my experiences in Spain have faded from my memory, the fact that my memory of Paul Robeson singing to us on the eve of our departure for the front is evergreen and is a measure of the impact of his singing. The effect was electric and inspirational, end quote. Photo here pictured is Paul Robeson with freedom fighters at the battlefront in Madrid, sometimes under artillery and machine gun fire. Robeson visited the shifting battlefronts to bolster the spirit of the Republicans with his songs. Robeson wrote in his autobiography that his time in Spain was, quote, a major turning point in my life. There, I saw that it was the working men and women of Spain who heroically giving, quote, their last full measure of devotion, end quote, to the course of democracy in that bloody conflict. From the ranks of the workers, of other lands, volunteers, and come to help in the epic defense of Madrid. And in Spain, I sang with my whole heart and soul for these gallant fighters of the International Brigade. So here you see Robson with uh, Captain Castillo. He was his um, guide through Spain. And um, during this campaign, Paul Robeson added a new song to his repertoire, the bitterly anti-Franco, the four insurgent generals, which expresses the wish that the tears of sorrow of Madrid, bombed by the fascists, should be avenged. It was a popular song of the resistance against Spanish generals, Franco, Moro, Conjuro, and Quiepo de Llano. Paul Robeson sang this version. You will hear two, a uh, few verses in English, and the rest will be in Spanish. And uh, it has been released on his Columbia Masterworks album in 1943. The next one is Ay Manuela, Viva la Quince Brigada, was originally a 19th century folk song commemorating the routing of Napoleon uh, in Spain. And it was taken up as a resistance song. And it, in the lyrics of solidarity, resilience, and hope for the collective struggle against fascism speaks very loud. And then we'll end um, with the Pete Bob Soldier Song, is one of Europe's best known protest songs, which wrote and sang. It exists in countless European languages and became a Republican anthem during the Spanish Civil War. So here we will start for you my choreography with Paul Robeson singing the four insurgent generals. Thank you. 
and it was written by uh, El Piayo, who was a flamenco guitarist and singer. And he was incarcerated in Cuba during the Spanish-American War in 1898. He wrote the lyrics that are going to appear on the screen as soon as we start to dance that are very present and it, it really is political commentary through the art of flamenco. Usually flamenco is not so, um, so political or so opinionated, but this one is and it spoke powerfully to me as part of the theme tonight. So we are going to do for you two sections of the song of the Tangos de Malaga del Piallo. But I don't see my dancers, and I forgot my prop, so I'll be right back.
The next dance will be Lisa's final chore choreography based on the great Spanish poet Garcia Lorca's song poem, Anda Yelio, which became a rallying cry for the resistance movement. The common belief is that Lorca was assassinated during the war for his support of the resistance and for his homosexuality. The dance was also inspired by Spanish Civil War poster art, which illustrates the changing roles of women during the war. It ends with the plaintive uh, music by the great Spanish composer Manuel de Fala. De Fala appealed to the nationalists to spare Lorca's life to no avail. After he left Spain, After he left Spain, after which he left Spain. <laughs> Sorry.
During the Spanish Civil War, almost 40,000 men and women from 52 uh, countries, including 2,800 Americans, including 88 black men and two black women, volunteered to travel to Spain and join the international brigades to help fight fascism. The U.S. volunteers came to be known collectively as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and served as soldiers, technicians, medical personnel, and aviators. The Lincoln Brigade initiated white, integrated white and black volunteers on equal basis. In 1940, the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade made Paul Robeson an honorary member. Founding member Milk Wolf said, quote, when I stood beside him to pin the star on his lapel, I had this feeling that Paul Robeson was not so much becoming a member of the Lincoln Brigade as that we were becoming a part of Paul Robeson. The last word on Paul Robeson was given to a longtime International Brigade supporter, the musical, the musician, actor, and activist, Harry Belafonte, quote, it was from Paul that I learned that the purpose of art is not just to show life as it is, but to show life as it should be. Paul Robeson, with members of the Lincoln Brigade, members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, So we will end this evening with Paul Robeson singing Old Man River. And you know that he changed the lyrics at the time that he did his uh, um, speech in, um, at Royal Albert Hall, from I'm tired of living and scared of dying till I, till I must keep fighting until I'm dying. And that this is the pivotal point where he changed those famous lyrics. And uh, then he recorded that version in his live in Carnegie Hall recital in 1958, which was his comeback recital, and it is on Columbia Masterwork. So we will end this evening with the beautiful singing of Paul Brooks. <laughs> Just keeps rolling, he keeps on.
give a round of applause for the great impact. Lisa and her dancers have done a fantastic job. Let's give them a round of applause.